Hello and welcome everybody to this uh, webinar that is totally sold out um, because we have some really exciting conversation to be had for the next hour. We have with us some very special guests as well, um, but we couldn't have done this without our sponsors. So we have um, My Life Diabetes Care, we have Dexcom and we have Abbott here today. So we have three um representatives from their these companies who will be talking to you in just a second and we also have our um speaker professor parfakar who obviously has made all of this happen this hybrid closed loop nice ta uh, has been instrumental in getting this uh through all of the loops and <laughs> loops <laughs> getting the loops through the loops um yeah so i think we'll probably have maybe a line from each of us about how we what we think this is gonna how this is gonna um make us feel how this is gonna work you know what what do you think about hybrid closed loop ta what was so shall i ask beth first what do you think um this means uh, to you yeah so hi i'm beth kelly i'm the lead diabetes specialist for wheelchair working community um i think yeah i think i can speak for most dsn super excited and i'm so pleased that we're here at this kind of pivotal stage like where it's happening in our career it'll be one of those moments I think we all look back at when we be like we're so glad we were there um but very very nervous too so exciting to find out some information tonight hopefully that will help us on the way yeah Tamsin hi I'm Tamsin I'm uh, one of the uh, DSN forum members and I'm also the lead uh, DSN at the Royal Stoke um so yeah, I mean, I think, you know, not that long ago, we started with Libra 2, didn't we? And um, it doesn't seem that long ago that we were putting people on Libra 2. And now we're, um, you know, being able to potentially get people started on a hybrid closed loop system, which I think, you know, I've been diagnosed with diabetes for over 40 years. And that was like a, a myth almost, um, you know, the cure, the, the, you know, the cure in 10 years and things like that, that you heard. So um, although it's not a cure, it is certainly going to take away some of that burden of, of living with diabetes. So it's just a really exciting time, as Beth said. Absolutely. Vicky? Yeah, so I'm Vicky. I'm a diabetes specialist nurse who works in primary care. So out of all of you here today, I'm probably the one who's maybe um, in a different kind of environment, but I'm also involved in education and training. So for this, I just can't wait to kind of hopefully be involved with education and training and, you know, um, support support healthcare professionals where possible. But I, I think from what I've seen of people already on this system, I guess two words really life changing. I just think it's pretty amazing, really. Yeah, absolutely. We hear from our um, sponsors. So should, should we go to Alex first from My Life Diabetes Care? What's, what does this mean for you and your in your line of work? <laughs> um, that's a very big question. Um, I think it's impossible to overstate the gravitas that this is this has uh, and is going to have. Um, from our side, I think the evidence speaks for itself and that's indisputable um but what really motivates us at my life diabetes care is the impact on quality of life and that's the thing that we hear the loudest and that's the thing that i think i'm most excited to see we, we heard um a couple of weeks ago from raymond Havorka, who's responsible for the cam aps algorithm that works with my life loop and he spoke about parents not only talking about uninterrupted night sleep for the first time since their child's diagnosis but but parents talking about how they have more time for their child that doesn't have diabetes so there's this huge um quality of life impact that's that's going to impact the person with diabetes but also their network and it's a real privilege to to be a part of that actually yeah absolutely and um, susan from dexcom Hi everybody, evening. Thank you for inviting us along. Um, so as everybody said, this is a significant milestone for people living with diabetes and I echo what you know you ladies have said um, before and for us at Dexcom it's about choice for patients, it's being able to access the technology that is right for them at the time that's right for them um, and for us you know we're just excited to be working with um, all of the, the DSNs out there, all of the HCPs out there and patients to to support this rollout across across the UK. So yeah, super excited. Brilliant. And and lastly, Sam from Abbott. 
Thanks. Hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm Sam Howard and I look after market access for Abbott Diabetes Care. And we share exactly the same sentiment of everybody else here, that this is such a marvellous milestone that we need to acknowledge and celebrate, um, you know, the difference it's going to make for people with diabetes. And at Abbott, we're just incredibly proud um, to be um, a very small part of this in terms of having options for, for people with diabetes and HCP. So um, as has just been said by Susan, there's more choice and um, that can only be a good thing for everybody. So really looking forward to this evening. Thank you very much. We already got questions coming in thick and fast, um, but I'm going to let Partha um, introduce himself and um, have a bit of an introduction as to what the hybrid closed loop um, NICE TA is, how it came about, all of that kind of introductory few minutes. Partha, you have the floor. <laughs> yes, um, thank you. I mean, a, a, a quick few thank yous to begin with. Uh, first of all, to the DSN Forum for hosting uh, industry colleagues. I've always been a fundamental part uh, of these sort of events. And for those dialing in, just to make you assured, uh, industry colleagues don't have any say on the content of the questions or anything. That's why I'm here. So don't worry about it. If you're dialing in, you know, the usual NHS thing. So um, I'm very grateful for the support. So, and uh, that's been a partnership which has been from day one, whether it's been with Libra, Dexcom, Pum companies, et cetera. So I think it, it's a bit of a story as to where we started off. If I'm honest, we started off 2020 uh, is when it all started, when we discussions with NICE. Then we gradually moved to uh, people talking about how do we do it? Did the evidence base stack up? We weren't quite sure. So we decided to fund at that point of time um, from NHS England, a pilot, which was done by 35 centres, if my maths is correct from those days, about 27 adult centres and I think about eight paediatric centres, nearly about 900 patients all across the country. Uh, Diabetes Technology Network, led by uh, uh, Pratik Chaudhary, Emma Wilmot and Alistair Lum um, from the adult side. From the pediatric side, it was uh, Fulia Metha, May Ng, uh, Fiona, uh, Peter Heinmarsh. All of these guys got together and uh, my hat's off to them for delivering a marvellous thing to us. We got all the data, we collected it, and then we went back to them in June 2022. Then it was sent for reporting, then the committee met together. The first meeting was had and we had lots of discussions. And again, I've written a recently a blog and hats off to people like Sufi and others who were on the panel to help us through. Uh, the first guideline came out, uh, which talked about the cutoff being uh, a no age cutoff. It was just 8%. And for everybody, which we pushed back, we looked through more data. We had lots of debates, lots of discussions. Then NICE came back with a second one, which was as it is, but with the caveat that we had to get to a um, cost-effective price before they put it out. Uh, and their question to us at that stage was, can you get a cost-effective price? So we went back to them because we have had some fabulous discussions with all industry colleagues, all of them, and saying that, yes, we can. Um, so the guideline is out. It's in that three, four week period whereby it's open to any legal challenge if people find or challenges, if people want to make some last minute points, we are confident we have come to a point, which is good. Um, and uh, hopefully um, it will be set in stone in the first week of December or thereabouts. And then the fun begins of delivery and all that sort of stuff. So that's the timeline. It's about, been about three years or so of my life uh, while we have been doing the other bits of the Libra and the CGM and pregnancy in the background. But as I always say, it's the, probably the final part in the jigsaw uh, as far as science can provide right now. So let's see where it goes. Cool, right. I'm gonna get us all into panel now. Um, okay, so um, we have got a few questions coming in, but I just wondered whether any of the DSM forum girls wanted to ask a question first, cause you know, we're on. <laughs> any questions you wanna ask? Oh, there's so many questions, isn't there? I don't even know where to start, but I suppose I'll, I'll start with a big one. Um, is there any funding coming to support DSNs to manage this? <laughs> so um, I think the short answer is that's what we're working on. 
because I think uh, just expecting people to deliver it uh, without any funding is a big ask and it's going to be very tough. And I think it's fair to say that we have done that sort of strategy uh, in the past with pumps. We've had 15 years of TAs of pumps and we can see the uptake. And look, you know, there are many reasons for it, but one of them is funding. So I think that's the work that we're doing right now. We uh, obviously lots of angles, Department of Health and everybody, but it's a work in progress. So um, I would say that let's the first step is let it settle down and then hopefully we'll bring some news. You know, yeah. Should tackle issues of how do you pay, workforce, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, even if NHS someone said here have five million pounds you can't just buy dsns that are yeah. trained up to do this off a tree so <laughs> it, it doesn't help everything but no, no absolutely and i think part of the workforce thing is whereby we will be very clearly depending on industry colleagues you know the yeah. onboarding side the education the supplies the out of power support all of that that a lot of it needs to come from industry as well because we don't have the capacity nor as you say the trained staff to do this so it, it, it's a it's a it's that conundrum is there absolutely mm -hmm. Vicky or Tamsin, do you have any questions before we go to the audience? Yeah, I was just going to say, we, I mean, I, you, you, we all work in our little silos, don't we? So we work in our own little counties and we struggle, you know, probably in a similar way, but maybe with different things with our own integrated care boards. How do we get over that obstacle in the sense that you have all the different integrated care boards and they all seem to do something a little bit different? Um, and how do we get it a bit more uniform in the sense that we don't have this, you know, lottery happening or parts of the country going green for hybrid closed loops and part going red, you know, for hybrid closed loops, you know, like they have done for Libra and Dexcom? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, just to give you an analogy, but see where we are now, there is no red. So I think you will find, as I always say, I think there will be, four, you know, with any innovation and we will go through this as well. So I don't expect everybody to go green immediately. I mean, that's going to be pretty impossible because you will have the right. We are ready. We want to go. And I'm saying that even if we had money, right, then you'll have a second group which will go like, OK, we are slowly training up and we are going to come online in the next six months. There'll be a third group who will come online because everybody else is doing it out of embarrassment because they're going, oh, I, this is we should do it. There'll be a fourth group who will always be resistant to it. They'll always find a reason to it. And I think that's where the money is important, right? So because I think a lot of the variation comes from people trying to cut corners, understandably, with tight budgets. So uh, let's see. Let's see what we do. And obviously, um, you know, I think there's the role of accountability that uh, us national leaders have so if it's a national priority we we have to deliver it and how we do it is also down to us and how we engage with people so I, I expect there to be variation to begin with there's nothing in the nhs which cannot have variation when you begin with but uh, do i expect it to level out in a couple of years or less yeah i do how fast it will level out will be uh, related to how we deliver it and what money we bring to the party so to speak all right, we've got 17 questions already. <laughs> cool. Right, <laughs> let's uh, have a look from the beginning. So uh, we have a good evening. I was wondering if you are currently self-funding a hybrid closed loop and not a child or pregnant, will this put you to the bottom of the queue for NHS funding? I have a Medtronic 780G pump funded by NHS, but I'm self-funding the Guardian 4 sensor, which has been incredible, but is costing a significant amount. So... Uh... So first of all, one of the things that we do try and avoid in these conferences and meetings is doing individual cases, but I will try to still answer that as best as possible. I don't, I, look, I don't know your details. I don't know your A1C, and I shouldn't know either in the public domain because that's a bit wrong. But I would say that if you're on a pump, and I would say that if you're on a pump and you're not quite getting anywhere and you're already trying to loop, etc., it probably does make it easier for the local system to get you moved on to it. So I don't think it's as black and white. There will be lots of lines as to how we do it. There will be some priorities, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I would say, what I could say is that if you are under our care, we would see you as, okay, is it easier to get you this rather than somebody who has to be trained from scratch with pumps? So there's two different things to it, I would say, the way we look at it. So I would say hold fire, let it all come down. I would say you would have a good case. So we shall see how it works out. Amazing. I mean, there's a few things on here which we don't, actually, we don't want to get into individual cases because we can't answer 
mm. kind of individual case we don't know what's going on in the background and stuff but things like um talking about the five-year plan do we know when that's going to be published presume when the, the actual ta is made final yeah, well, what so, it would look so- like Amazing work being done by the uh, team, if I'm honest, in our, in our diabetes team led. We've got a full on team on this one. And uh, one of our you know main directors is working on the five year plan. We're talking to people. It needs to be realistic and, and in the sense of something that, you know, you guys can deliver. You know, if I come to you and say, right, I want 35,000 pumps to be started tomorrow or over the next six months. Well, you could do it, but you'll have to stop everything else, right? So we need to be careful and cognizant that we're not putting uh, professionals under pressure in a really heated environment, which already is. So um, I would say that there will be a trajectory, there will be an agreed pathway, how many people want to go on pumps, what are the priorities, and that's the way we want to do it. So it will be a five-year plan, and uh, that will be published as well. Uh, Again, their best estimates, right? So that's all we can go on. We're projecting the future and see how we go from there. Yeah. And will will there be any comms coming out from NHS England and the charities have a part to play and stuff here? Because we've already seen yeah, patients absolutely. emailing in saying, I, I want this next week, I'm allowed this now, and I already self-fund yeah. or things like that. And it's like, well, actually, still hold fire. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, so one of the things we want to do is that in Portsmouth, one of my colleagues has drafted this really nice letter, which is going to go out to all the type 1 diabetes patients, which basically saying, look, guys, we will get to you, but it will take time. We can't get to you immediately. And I think at an individual level, I can understand everybody saying, but I want it now. It makes my life better now. Why can't I get it? And I think that you could argue is one of the other flip sides of a public health system, whereby you are, uh, everybody's paying the same tax, Right. So then as providers, we are faced with a situation where so who do we go first? Because there's only so many people I can see in my clinic. And it causes angst. Of course it does. But I think, and I'll answer with this question, which has come up already a number of times, right? And I'll answer this because this will come up. I think it's already has, which is, isn't it really unfair that there's 20, 25% of type 1 diabetes who are not going to get it, right? So let me, I think it's important for people to remember history on two counts. So the pumps have uh, TA have been around for 15 years and forget about, and people have always said, oh my God, that age balance was 8.5. How wrong is that, right? Anybody 8% can go, why 8.5%? The irony is that 15 years later, there's about 65,000 people in this country with type 1 diabetes with an age balance more than 8.5% who haven't got a pump. That's the irony. I mean, forget about seven, so 7.5. So we're not even getting it to people in the past who qualified. Then come to the next phase, which is if this was available for everybody tomorrow, let's say we sort of went back to nice and I want this for everybody. I can assure you that people who have got higher HbA1c, people who are trying for pregnancy will have to be prioritized. And if that's what the case is, then we will get to you probably in a couple of years, two, three years or so. That's the sort of trajectory which we have. Now, you may, you may not appreciate that, but as Beth has mentioned, we don't have the staff to do it, even if we lean on industry. My point to everybody is that NICE normally does a review, which we'll ask for, and in the next two, three years, it might so happen the rest of the gap may be closed. So, and that's what, you know, is my job, as I've always said to everybody. And I think the other part of the history, which I'd like everybody to remember, we're talking about, of type 1 diabetes or thereabouts being eligible, right? All of you, especially our panel, will be aware of those days of Libra when only 20% were eligible even for Libra. That's only four years ago. And look at it now. So I think give the time, give the faith. There is no other country that would offer you uh, a tax-funded system that we are about to do. So um, I would say that... And I said this this morning in the conference as well, that I think this will become standard care in the next three, four years. Please give your professionals the time to breathe a little bit before they come on play. They have to learn about these new systems. There are new pumps coming out. There are new algorithms coming out. They, we have all have to learn as well. We don't want to give you something that goes completely wrong. So there is that too. So that's what I would say. Okay. We've got a, quite a few questions coming in about the funding side of things. Um, yeah. There's a good one from Reza. Uh, Zaidi, uh, he said, Partha, well done again. Um, to those who may not be aware, can you explain the reasons for going through NHS supply chain as the vehicle to deliver hybrid closed loop in regions as opposed to separate deals with industry? 
So uh, what we are looking at is the possibility of doing um, you know, a national piece of work. So one framework that comes nationally, we want to do it through supply chain because that's the national body which does it. So rather than, so then it makes, so we're trying to make the process very simple, whereby we say that's the framework to which you buy. There's one framework rather than doing it in every single area. Uh, of course, what it does do is give the industry also the volume on a national basis, which you won't be able to get on a local basis. That's the reason we want to go down the route, uh, because I would be, I think it's fair to say that previous attempts of saying to each area, get a deal with the palm companies and best of luck hasn't probably worked out um, because the other thing that you get is um, it, it, um, it probably isn't fair on all companies. And I, I'm quite keen that every company and every pump option is available on the table, not just for the company, but for the patient. To do that, it's quite powerful to do it on a national basis. So that's the reason we're looking at exploring those ways. Um, there's so many questions on here. Beth, do you want to pick one? <laughs> well, one from someone who, so as a community DSN, quite a good question. Um, if, and you mentioned you think this will be the standard of care, and I do agree, I've been shouting about that in my local area, but do you think it will become such a standard of care that all DSN teams or community impact, like more acute DSN teams will all be doing hyperclose loops? Or because at the moment we know that pumps, and part of the problem is how a lot of staff aren't trained in it. So pumps are seen as a speciality within the speciality and they're, you, they're quite cordoned off into a yeah. certain pump nurse or you know yeah. team. I mean, the, the way I see it, so community. So I work with community DSNs. We've got fantastic community DSNs where we are across a massive region. And I think their bulk of the role is looking after, you've got this new challenge, young type to diabetes and all of that. So it's a question of which one you prioritize and which one you want to go for. What I would suggest to everybody is to learn about the systems because you need to know what the heck it is. It's not about starting them on it. There'll be lots of people on it. It's a bit like you all, everybody learning about Libra, right? Now it's standard care. So if you've got patients left, right, and center on this particular technology, which could happen in the next two, three years, I think there's a responsibility to learn about as part of your CPD, just understanding what is it, what to do if it goes wrong, what's the safety side of things, what's the escalation of the local specialist team who might be doing that sort of side of things. So that, that's the way I would probably look at it. Will everybody be doing it? I think a little bit depends on your desire, a little depends on your local system, a little bit depends on what your local specialists feel. Do they feel... Um, broad enough in their mind and do they feel uh, comfortable enough for you to do it i think and also then the bigger thing is that what are you dropping to do it right uh, and i think it's fair to say community dsns uh have got a fair bit on their plate not to say hospital dsns don't but community dsns are dealing with so much stuff right now coming at you from so many angles so i would say uh yeah that, that's the way i would look at it but you certainly should upskill yourselves in learning about what is it, what's coming, just like yeah. that about Libra and XCOM. And it's like being able to have those conversations. I mean, a lot of community teams are the ones doing the structured education for you know people with diabetes and stuff, and you need to be able to at least have those discussions to explain what they are and those kinds of things. So yeah, that probably yeah. leads into the next question about specialist dietitians also helping with training and um, maximizing people. I think yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think you know. Hey, listen, I'm a big believer in MDTs. And I think it's interesting. There's another Twitter conversation going about people saying that, do you actually believe in anybody beyond doctors? And I was like, well, I don't know. I don't know how much else I can say I believe in MDTs and nurse specialists and pharmacists and everything. Anybody's part of an MDT. Uh, see, listen, I've got a very simple philosophy in life, which is type 1 diabetes or chronic disease for any matter. sits on three planks. I've said this all the time, which is self-management, peer support. And the final important bit is trained professional. The important bit there is trained. It doesn't have to be a doctor. It doesn't have to be a nurse. It doesn't have to be a pharmacist. It can be anybody who's trained properly to do it. It could even be a person living with type 1 diabetes. So it's a lot of those things that need to come into the sort of uh, play arena, I would say. But absolutely, specialist dietitians, of course, you're going to be part of this. Specialist pharmacists, of course, you're going to be part of this. Learn about it. Train up. If you want to do it, who's stopping? I'm not going to put any barriers to anybody doing it, if I'm very honest. We need all hands on deck. You know, we yeah. can't say that we don't have the staff and then not let people do it if they're trained and doing it. That's yes. the way I would say. Um, I was at a I, session today with um, a company and they were saying they don't even need the healthcare professional in the in the start now. As long as you yeah. give them the settings, they will do the start without you, which is, you know, even easier. 
I think the question with all those things is about liability. That's what the thing is, isn't it? So that's the biggest thing that you as specialist nurses, me as a doctor, are sitting there going like, all right, that's all fantastic. What happens if it goes wrong? Am I the one in trouble? Or is it you? Right? That's that's where this thing all sits. So I think that's important when you think about it. It's about training the right people and who, who holds the liability if it goes wrong, right? And it's a machine. It can go wrong. So those are the important discussions to be put in play. That's the governance side around it, isn't it? It's like... You know, you know, it, it, do we sit as consultants and supervise specialist nurses? No, not in a million years. That would be silly. But there was once upon a time that used to happen, right? But mm. your level of knowledge is so high now. You're comfortable with saying, yeah, there we go. So I think there is that side of things. And that's, you know, consultants don't know every single bit about closed loops either. So I think that balance is in, in the play, I would say. Okay. Mm. Um, we've got another question saying, do you think specialist teams will need to prioritise hybrid closed loop over other activity? And if so, what would be suggested that could and should be stopped? <laughs> yeah. so, I think it goes back to two things, doesn't it? So when do people start prioritising? People start prioritising when they don't have the money and they don't have the workforce, right? That's the time you prioritise. If you've got both, you're not going to prioritise anything. You're going to do everything, right? That's a simple logic of life. So. I think if this landed as a, hey, listen, guys, it's a TA, it's all in your baseline budget, best of luck, crack on, we would have a very small uptake across the country, I suspect, and these discussions would be happy, would be happening as, right, do you start stopping patient diabetes? Do you stop doing foot care? What do you do? But that's what we're trying to avoid, right, is to sort of say, no, we would like people to continue with what they're doing, and this is the added bits and support from industry, support from other professionals, et cetera, to do it. So that's what I would say is at the moment, we are not talking about deprioritizing anything in existing diabetes services to do it. Uh, but, you know, if it push comes to shove, then we'll make a decision. And see where quite, we that. quite a few comments about did all of the pump companies come uh, agree? Is this every pump or is it just certain ones? No, no, no. Everybody's had, we've had really productive conversations with everybody. So what we have done, this is the stage, the, the last few months has been about asking in the last few weeks, has been, guys, do you want to, are you in a position to do something different to what the price structures are? And everybody has said yes. So now becomes the big actual work. So we have looked at their, you know, I wouldn't say offers or bids or something. They, they've given us some indications where they would like to go. We are happy with it. So it's quite positive. I think the worry would have been if anybody had said no. And I can absolutely assure you, Ed, because I know there's a lot of questions. Every company has come, and I'll, I'll make this absolutely clear. Every company has shown a massive willingness to help people with type 1 diabetes. It's a big, big shift of you know outlook. And I, I, I must say that I have zero complaints about industry colleagues at this juncture about coming to the table. So just to reassure everybody, we are definitely in play with all the companies and I have nothing but good words for them this stage. Good. Um, there's lots of questions about individual kind of, I'm I'm this, I'm that individual mm. group. So is there going to be guidance coming out on priority groups? Because at the moment I see, certainly my ICB, we're all in talks about um, what we think we would prioritise and there's obviously disagreements. With us. So is there going to be national guidance in that five-year roll-up plan of the groups to prioritise over other groups? And will there be bending in that or will that be quite strict? Um, no. Uh, so, okay. So who are the priority groups? So we're going to do a bit of a mix and a match, if I'm honest. So people have said, should children be prioritised? The answer is to me, yes. Right. And I'll tell you why because you change the dynamics of a whole population we're doing it. You're future-proofing a population. And I, I'm going to be slightly biased and say, as a parent myself, I think there is a slight bias I have. So I would say I, that's what I would want. It may not happen in the end, because people might say that's ageist or whatever. I fundamentally believe that if you've got a young one with type 1, I think our job is from day one is to give them the best care we can. That, that's my view. And people may not agree with that, uh, but that's my personal view, Okay. And the reason for that is that you've got incremental benefit. You know, imagine what we are saying to children is apart from you're taking away your worry about finger sticks, we're taking worry about insulin injections, whatever. And you're reducing the risk for the rest of the life. That to me is a to me is a no-brainer, right? 
then you come then there comes the second group which is pregnancy right and the reason for pregnancy is the data we have with adap trial that's come out two people at one go that sort of stuff now the after that the hybrid is local systems i think should be given the possibility and the chance to look at their own databases and make some of the, because some of the conversations i have with people like alistair lum and sufian hussein has been exactly that right you should have that flexibility if you remember the libra days we made it very hard right and that was de deliberately done and i take full responsibility for that at that stage because that was about opening the door because don't forget we didn't have any nice guidelines on that at all this was a nhs england sole business play right in those days there was nothing there was no ng17 ng18 this one is different so my view would be i think you need to think about your local dynamics should it be people with severe mental health illness will it help them will it be worse if they do it should it be people who are adolescents, would that help them? Or would they like, you know what, I don't want to do any technology? Should it be people who are already on pumps, uh, but not achieving good control? And you can argue what is good control and should we give it to them earlier? Would it be easier to do it because they're already on a pump? So all you need to do is connect the sensor or upgrade the sensor. So I think there'll be a degree of local freedom as it should be to think about which groups you want to get to um so th that's my view some of it is emotional some of it is operational but you know some is a mixture of what you can deliver in time with the workforce and some with evidence interesting um then did you have a question about pregnancy oh a question about pregnancy no i didn't have a i had another question <laughs> though sorry <laughs> Um, I had a question, sorry, about um, about training from sort of both um, HCPs, I suppose, and sort of uh, patients about how they can learn so mm. that obviously they can go to their health cares and actually show, yeah. you know, yeah. the information. Yeah. So I think the, uh, the education piece, there are going to be many prongs to it. One is industry based for their products. One is with the Diabetes Technology Network. I know that there's a lot of work going on with DigiBeat and all those organizations, the pediatric space. There is furious work going on in the education space, I can tell you right now, because it's in everybody's interest to do it. So uh, bear with us. That will all come out one after the other for healthcare professionals, uh, for patients, etc. But we're working on that. Because I'm going to take a couple here, if you don't mind, from this one. Uh, yeah. Has there been any discussion on inequality? Which is a really good question. Inequity for those who cannot fund the correct fund the necessary. Yes. And that's going to be in. The, so those are the things. Let me give you a couple of examples of why a national contract is useful. So think of this situation. Let's say somebody's on a pump, okay? And she wants to get pregnant or gets pregnant. But they're in the four-year contract of the pump. What do you do now? Right? Do you take them off the pump and incur the four-year cost? Or do you say you can't get pregnant till the four-year contract is over? What do you do, right? So those are the things we need to sit down with companies and agree that, hey, listen, what is it that we can do to make it smooth? Because I'm not going to say to any woman, you can now can't get pregnant for four years because you're locked in a contract. You shouldn't try. That, that just would be wrong, okay? So we need to tackle those. Similarly, the point about the phones, exactly what we need to put on the table when we do a national contract. So right, so what, what is your way? So for example, there are some companies, If it, what do you do if they don't have an Android phone? We need to think about it, right? Not everybody can go and afford an Android phone. So what do we do? What is industry going to do to help us? So those bits are all going to be in place at the moment. Uh, so and that's what the exciting bit for us and uh, we'll obviously reach out to professionals giving the ideas just like you have you know what do you do about this bit and that patient and that one which also ties in with the lovely comment which is there how do you know this will you not run into GL, glp1 analog like shortage there's slight two differences on that one glp1 analog shortage is because what was tweeted by elon musk and kim kardashian and it's exploded in the private market we're not expecting that to happen with closed loops because Nobody can use it bar people with type 1 diabetes, but absolutely we need assurances of supplies, which we have explained to companies. And that will all be part of the deal that we do, right? Do you have supplies? What are the things, a backup plan, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that. That's the way we will do it. So I think people are worried about sensors because they're being used in sort of sports people, aren't they? Um, some of the I'm sensors. Say something. I'm going to say something about that. I've read, I've listened to that a lot. So I think. Let me explain to you how business economics works. And that's my view, right? I'm not explaining to you a, a worldview. This is the way I see it. Industry are not charity. 
They're trying to help people, but at the same time, they're making business and money, right? That's how they work. They've got shareholders, et cetera, et cetera. If you've got companies seeing a wider market, right, which is people without diabetes and they're using sensors, do you know what happens with volume? Price drops for everything, right? So you might look at it and get really annoyed, but in an odd way, it might be opening up the market more and getting us better prices, okay? So I don't have any issues about it as long as nobody with type 1 is getting deprived of it. And that we don't have a situation like that in the country, right? If anybody's out there, so I can understand when people were sending me pictures of their cats being a CGM and nobody could get a CGM. Now, that's all right. That's absolutely not on. And we I love cats and dogs, but still, the human being gets it first. But we don't have that situation right now. So we... I'm quite keen to see how the market responds to that. So that's the way of uh, business one, I would say, so to speak. So mixed feelings about that from my point of view. Uh, do you, I'm going to take one. Do you agree with ICBs making clinicians feel an IFR for patients top 10, opt, Omnipod 5? Well, the thing is, so when do you do an IFR? When it's not in the NICE guidelines, right? Otherwise, you don't need an IFR. If you're filling an IFR and it's in a nice TA, then somebody's sold you porkies, right? So if you are doing an IFR and they're asking you to do it for an Omnipod 5 hybrid closed loop, they're asking you to do it because it's not a nice TA yet. So once the nice TA lands, we would expect that not to be an IFR. So that's the way I would look at it. Hybrid closed loops on an Omnipod 5 is not in a nice TA as yet. So that's what I would suggest to remember. So um yeah that's the difference between a nice ta and ng and all that sort of stuff the next question probably links into that about will there be a hierarchy of what you can offer or will it they just no. be able to have any of them no no the eventual aim is to get everybody everything why not right i mean that's always the holy grail right you come to clinic so this is where i see it working again it's not an nhs england position yet it may become but not yet um so this is what i want you see somebody in clinic right? Any of us. And you go like, you fit the criteria. Do you want one? They say, yes, I do. You should give them all the options. That could be a website. That could be an online Zoom chat, which you've organized with lots of people together as a group. And they go, like, I want that one, right? I would love to then call up industry and say, right, we've got candidates for you. What's the process? How are we going to put them on? I want you to do everything for me. I want to see them next in clinic already on it, right? Smooth. Why am I going to take on all the responsibility, right? That would be the perfect scenario. Can we get there? We shall see. It's the NHS. So, but that would be such a good thing to do, wouldn't it? You know, it just takes the burden off you. You're just going like, great. They're ready. And they come back. It's done by industry. They're trained. They have the supply sorted. And then what you're doing is you're seeing them back on the loop. Super, right? That would be the ideal situation so we shall see we shall see that's going to be exciting if we can do that from that point of view i would say it will be great there's problems at the moment obviously they can't clinical advice so there's that in between bit isn't there of where the dsn comes in with the phone calls 100 percent. i'm doing this and i don't know what i'm doing and then the dsn's got to step in and, and pick it up but um mm. i think I, last time we did a webinar with you about hybrid closing, when the draft thing came out um yeah. we asked well, so if certain ICBs or teams offer just two of the hybrid closed loop systems, that's why, that... going to, that's why we want to do a national one. Okay, so they can't, no, they can no longer just say. No, no, we... we. So there'll be quite clear guidelines on this. this. Is what we're expecting. If we can land what we are trying to do, what we're going to say to ICBs that you purchase from that particular one, which has got choice for everybody, and it's likely we'll probably get better deals than the ICB. So um, if we can do it properly. So it would be unnatural for the ICB to stick to something which costs them more money in this environment, I would say. So um, I would I would be more hopeful that this would be, um, you know, this would be the way to do it. Because I've got a, a question here, which I think uh, has got, I'm going to go with the ones which gets lots of thumbs up, which basically means people probably want that answer. So will there be clear comms to all that this is a five-year plan to reduce the risk of continuous contact with DSN team? Ask for it now, places. As we know, I, uh, yes, it will be, but you'll still get phone calls. It doesn't matter what I put out there, what we all say, because people want it now. That that's the ben that's the benefit and the uh, flip side of the NHS because everything's here. Okay, 
So I think it will need a lot of work from our patient charity partners to also put it out there. We know people will be disgruntled if they don't get it straight away. But there are also people who will have to understand that we are prioritizing certain groups for a reason, right? So if uh, so, that that will be a, a bit of a challenge. I expect that. But I think, do you know what I would say to you all? I think you should all just turn it back towards me. I genuinely think you should just go like, it's not our fault, it's Partha's fault. I don't really don't mind because um, it is our decision, right? It's not your decision, right? And uh, there is a reason. I'm very happy to meet with any patient groups to explain why I'm doing it. Right? And I think... I would have hoped that over the last seven years, I built enough goodwill in the community that I can take those and people will appreciate and hopefully believe that what we are trying to do. Uh, so I'm very happy to engage with any patient groups and anybody, even locally, with to basically explain what we are doing. So that is uh, the view I have. So there's a couple okay. of things. Oh, sorry, oh. Yeah, Vicky go, Vicky go. Yeah, I'll yeah I was that. just going to ask you about pregnancy. So there was a question here about will there be any guidance within the TA about um, so women who are planning pregnancy or become pregnant who go on to close loop, what then happens after pregnancy? Is there going to be any guidance around that? They're going to be on a four year contract, aren't they? Okay. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> That's simple maths. <laughs> Yeah, I think there were some comments about, oh, I'm just going to say that I'm planning pregnancy then and then I'll get one. And it's like, well, who can monitor who's up, what no, they're up? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I mean, people can. I mean, listen, I mean, it, you know, as somebody said to me, I'm deliberately going to make my diabetes control worse to get a closed loop. I always say you could do that. I said this to somebody else. You could do that. Absolutely. And take the risk that you take with it. Or you could wait for a couple of years and still have great control and still get it. So it's up to you. What what are the risks you are taking to get there? Because let's say you've got an HP on C of 7.2%, okay? And you don't qualify under the present rules and you're doing well and you're really frustrated. If you want to make your HP on C worse, the risk you're taking is you, okay? So you so that that's your individual decision. I can't stop anybody from doing that. I would suggest you don't do that uh, because the harm isn't to us. The harm is just to you, however period of time you do that over. So, but I can't stop anybody. And, you know, I think if people say that I'm, uh, I would like to get pregnant, I'm thinking of pregnancy, fine. You know, what, what, you know, or as I said, or you can wait and we can get there. So yeah, I think that because our preconception clinic, you know, it's quite intense. And I think I wouldn't want to take every other week off work to go and see the consultant and sit in hospital and wait for four yeah, hours yeah. or whatever it is for the, all the midwives to do their bits and stuff. So, yeah, I'd probably say wait a year because the preconception appointments are yeah. pretty be going um if you don't yeah, actually I, I think you're absolutely right so i think it, it's it's one of those things we'll see how it plays out right we'll have the numbers and stuff and all that so i mean sarah jane asked a really good question how can the advantage of closed loops be promoted to those who refuse pumps and i think we need to realize is that a lot of people who don't like technology right yeah. so at the moment our libra and dexcom one so total cgm uptake in this country is about 94 95 percent the other six percent are mostly people who have said no thanks i've got patients who have said yeah no thanks man i'm doing okay and it's not like you have to convince them because their h1c is actually really good because they've got fitted into a routine so i think to the question you ask uh i think we will have to do lots of publicity and say look this is where it is etc it's up to people to decide. Um, there is a very good evidence of when people get to the adolescent age, they come off technology. A lot of people come off pumps because they don't like it attached to them, which is well recognized as well. So it's it's um, it, it's it's at that point of time. So we shall see. We shall see. So, but, but again, you know, I don't want to create more work for ourselves. We need to get through the numbers we can get through first, and then go to there. So, yeah. Would you be for, for so anybody that's sort of at that four year contract period now mm -hmm. and getting ready to make a choice? Would you be saying to them, perhaps hold off for a couple of months yeah. until the yeah. TA comes out? I, I would say so. I think because, um, and I would say so because uh, do you want to lock yourself? Yes and no, in the sense like all the pumps now are doing loops, right? So, uh, would you be eligible for it if you're already on a pump and doing that? You probably would be. So, you know, th those groups are already there in the sense you burn a pump, you're not doing well, you'll get it. So is it going to change hugely? Not really. It's going to, I mean, we're talking about a couple of months at tops where we go. So it's up to you as to where you want to go. Do you want to come off a pump and go on injections for a bit? It's a personal choice, isn't it? So I always go like, you know, um, 
this and that, where we go. Um, Ellie makes a really interesting point. We have to be cautious. The industry don't end up recruiting loads of DSNs across from the NHS. That's a risk, but industry pays DSNs better, right? It's already happened. A lot yeah. of our friends have uh, jumped ship last and year. I, and I do not blame anybody, right, for that. As you know, we know about you know not going into political circles. Nurses' pay should be much better. You know, we know that. So if people are being offered better jobs and better working conditions, and you know, I I fully understand. But again. In one funny way, if they are then helping to onboard the patients. Yeah. So it's, it's a roundabout way of doing it. So, yeah, uh, I think it's um, it's one of those things as you go along. The good question uh, about, can you sorry. explain why insulin pumps have a four-year contract warranty mm -hmm. um, and when other tech equipment doesn't usually have that and they can change it a bit more frequently because it, it restricts the... Um, people with diabetes from changing and stuff and I do have a bit of a headache thinking if they wanted to change it annually can you imagine the paperwork um, and it would so be not, an absolute nightmare. So not, <laughs> so not all companies have got a four-year contract lock no. right? that's number one and number two is that the four-year contract um, as I understand gives us a better deal because of it's a bit like buying a mobile phone with a long contract does that make sense when they sit there and go like I have a phone for three years and you have to pay 22 pounds a month I mean, after three years, you probably paid the same amount you would have paid. But, you know, it's it's that philosophy of longer attachment with the company gets you a better pay and all that sort of stuff. So we will explore that as well, uh, for sure. Um, uh, but we need to be aware that that might jack up the price, which makes it even tricky to get them in. So all those things will have to be sort of in the mix of uh, discussing as to where we go. Yeah. What about children that are already on a hybrid closed loop transitioning to adult care with a lower HbA1c and now they oh, don't fit right. the criteria? No debate on that one. If you're on a no. pump, uh, closed loop, nobody takes anybody off a closed loop. Uh, no, exactly. unless the person uh, it, That's an absolute straight red line, which I can say right now. I don't, I don't want think anybody. anyone would ever do that. <laughs> well, we have had examples. Really? Of people, yeah, 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 we've had people coming off pumps. I've had recently a couple of examples where they've been given a holiday off a pump and I don't even understand what that means. Right? You can't have a holiday from type 1 diabetes. What does that even mean? So um, we are quite keen not for not none of that to happen. I think the way they're transferring across from pediatrics should be exactly the same unless the individual wants to come off it. And then it's our job to try and explain why you shouldn't, blah, blah, blah. But I think that's very, very straightforward. Yeah. Uh, what is that? Have NHS procurement advised naturally in the nice tier? Do we need to know? Please don't get involved in anything locally. Leave it with us. Um, we are very clear that we would like to handle this. Um, just we will give you comms, you know, we'll let you know when you need to get involved, but let the first nice TA land and then we'll go from there. Have you missed anything big? Uh, An interesting in question about um, maybe parents, carers, or you know, people like that that are caring for people with diabetes, not necessarily parents of children, but parents of maybe adults. Um, yep. and they want it for their loved ones but perhaps those loved ones don't want it and their yep. the carers are obviously very worried they've seen this they want it for their their person so I mean I know as a DSM what we what we have to say what we would say but if, will there be any advice about that kind of thing in the TA um it's a bit no the TA, TA, TA will not, won't have any of those because of the simple reason TA is just a clinical thing right this is the sign this is what we think this is who are this is the group who should get it and it's cost effective that's all that NICE's job is the rest of it is us how we operationalize it what we say in our comms so uh, I think it's always good to have those ideas when we do finally build our comms you know how how much we put in the comms out to people so a lot of these questions we will answer I mean there's a just slightly sidetracking this really good question uh, from Mary who says you know is there you know will there be a separate stream for success tracking for onboarding new people to pumping so it doesn't get penalized so first of all nobody's going to get penalized this is there is no price okay um so rest assured number one nobody's going to get penalized nobody's going to get some super prizes mm -hmm. what we do want to do uh, which is going to come very soon is we want to do a what we call a resetting and a baseline audit of every center we just need to know where we are right now okay so that will come out to you all we just want to know how many people are in pumps how many people are on closed loops at all that gives us a starting base before we roll the dice and i think that's quite important to do uh and the reason for doing that is uh pediatric teams uh input into audits is guess how much 
Any of you ladies want to pick? What's their return percentage of audits? I would say quite high. But... 100. Yeah, I was going to say. I would have gone. What is the return in adults? Wasn't it 42%, something like that? For 40. So we have had, you know, when we have gone out to centres and said, according to our data, you don't have any patients on pumps. Lots of centres, and that's an outrage. We've got 300 people on pumps. And I said, that is why you need to submit data. So can I encourage everybody to please ask themselves, their teams, to please submit data? Because then we know where we are as a baseline. That's going to come out very soon. So that's the first part of the work we want to do, is find a baseline who's where with pumps and closed loops. There's a question about type three, but I think that's already answered in the TA, isn't it, Tamsin? You were saying about that one. Yeah, there is something mentioned, isn't there, in the TA about that uh, type three C was reviewed as part of of it, and that there wasn't um... evidence. Yeah, so it is in there for when it's published formally on Nice. It is it is answered in there. Yeah, I mean. Uh... Uh, yes, I think let's see how it evolves that industry. I think we have a job, you know, we managed to get type 3 CCGM, which I think is a massive start. I fully understand the frustration because I've got a lot of people who've got type 3 C who behave just like type 1. There's no difference, really. They don't have a pancreas with functions. How it's happening is a slightly moot point, isn't it? Whether it's autoantibodies or it's due to them having surgery or pancreatitis or whatever. So I understand the frustration, but give us some time on that. We might, you know, ask that in the review to have another look at it and see what we can do, given that they've used that analogy for CGMs. So bear with us. I'm going to answer this one from Fiona because I'm worried that each ICB will interpret the TA guidelines differently. They are guidelines after all. They're not. There's a technology appraisal. It's a legal document. It's a legal mandate to deliver it. This is not an NG. So you ne we need to make that very, very clear. I'm not quite sure how it's open to interpretation when the, it's going to very clearly state all children. That basically means all children. Or when it says any adult more than HBNC more than 7.5, that's uh, we can't make it any more black and white than that. So we wouldn't, uh, and, uh, and we will be tracking those if any ICBs want to make it. They might, ICBs can do priorities, quite rightly, but they will uh, it's unlikely icbs change around tas uh icbs can of course look into ngs which is the now guidance uh but not on this one mm, there's quite a good question about those that already have a pump via the nhs teams and want to self-fund cgm can they self-start on them themselves on a closed loop um or do they have to wait for training from companies teams um you know whoever I suspect if you're looking at being funded by the NHS in due course, the question is how far, how long do you want to sell fund? If you want to sell fund for the rest of your life, you can crack on whatever. It's your money. Do whatever you want. If, however, eventually your, your view is that I want to get the NHS to fund this, I suspect the NHS will demand something in return. How can you follow our process and et cetera? So I think there will be a bit of a mix and match. It's I My, my advice would be that if you're self-funding, please say it to the team and have a very clear plan as to where the lines go. Where do you go? What do you what what teams don't want is you come around eight months later and say, look, I've self-funded this. My HBO has got better. Can you now fund it? And they are now stuck with the rules because you don't fit the rules, right? We don't know where you were before. So it becomes really tricky. So I would say is that it's the best thing I would advise. And this is what I say to a local pay. Look, if you want to self-fund something which isn't available, please tell me so I can start making the case for you now. And tell me, I'm going to do this for six months, after which I really need your help to get permission. That's the way I want to sort of look at it. So, you know, somebody asked about an IFR. That's when IFR comes into play, because you're doing a funding request of you, because you were there, you didn't fit the criteria, you got here, now can we make the case for you? That's the way I would ask you to think about. Yeah, kind of hard, though. We've got a lot of patients doing that locally and it's like well ethically it's quite hard because they've obviously they're privileged they can afford it and so they can't it's seen as sort of queue jumping all those other people that do not have yeah. access to tech can't afford it and it's like well as a as a nurse and as the nhs national as you said nationally funded system um yeah it's difficult for ourselves yeah. to, to manage it so um i've got one question how do you define best possible management it's quite clear what best possible management is basal bolus insulin mm. cgm which is standard care, that's the best possible management. There is no best possible management. Basal bolus insulin is quite clear in the NICE guidelines. Have a look at NG17, 18. It talks to you about base, best possible management. 
It's uh, basal bolus insulin, background of education and use of CGM. Yeah, time has absolutely flown by <laughs> and we only have about three or four minutes left. So I'd like you to pick your last question and then we'll do a roundup. So pick your... your the... Let me have a look. See, it's, I feel like being a... Pick, your, pick your most exciting ones, Carl. Uh, okay, that's a good one, actually, because it's got nine uh, ticks on it. Given the five-year rollout, ICBs have stated you have mentioned this nice tea applies to super centers only. Therefore, there are steps taken to identify which hospital the ICB regions. Wouldn't that equate to a panel of clinicians making a decision? How is this different from postcode lottery? Very good question. So let me explain that one to you. When we went to pediatric teams, we asked them, who wants to do it? And do you know what pediatric teams said? All Everyone. Of them. <laughs> so guess what? There are no super centers in pediatrics. Everybody's doing it because they're ready, they're trained, they have got 45% of their children already on pumps. So they're ready. When we went to adult teams, some people said, we don't want to do it. Some people said, uh, let's think about it. Some people said, we're really ready. So what we floated is the idea of doing it in some centers to begin with while the others trained up. This is also why we're doing the refresh of the audit data to see how many people have got how many pumps. And we could say to them, if you are not ready now, let's say, how do you, what are you doing to get ready in the next year? So super centers are not picking people. This is not me just picking my friends. This is based on data that's available. And that's the problem. I go back again. More than 50% of adult centers didn't give us any data for us to pick the centers. All right. So don't worry. This is not about people just doing a postcode lottery. The eventual aim is everybody does it. What we need to make sure is the ones who are saying, I don't want to do it. The question becomes, how are you going to look after the children coming to you from peds? And in this modern world, if you're going to say, I'm not going to do it as a center, not because of any staffing issue, but I just don't want to do it, then should you do type 1 diabetes care at all? Right? So those are bigger questions. That's why. So the super center ideas were floated at the idea to begin with, to see, and that's simply to be wanted to flush out centers to come out and say, and that's what we've got. So eventually, everybody does it. But And just to finish with that, don't forget the uptake of insulin pumps in adults is... 12%, only 12. So lots to cover. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Partha. So that's just about time. Um, we've, we've probably got about 30 seconds left for our um, companies to come back on if they'd like to have the final words. Um, should we go with Alex? What did you think to all of that? Well, <laughs> I just think it's, it's just wonderful. It's really great to hear basically everyone working together, isn't it? And that's certainly, I think, reflective on what what we're feeling is it's, it's a massive task ahead of us there's lots of questions um but we're all going to work as hard as we can to make sure it gets delivered brilliant sam samantha sorry <laughs> hi i same thing it was very interesting to see there's a lot of very practical questions about the implementation and and how that's going to look like so again um following what alex has said you know from industry we're here to support in any way we can please reach out and you know we all want this to work the people with diabetes that can benefit. And Susan? Um, so yeah, just echo what Sam and Alex have said that, um, you know, industry were here to, to support and to look for different ways of working, solutions, um, ways that we can make this happen. So yeah, work with your industry partners for sure. Okay, well, I think that's that's it, eight o'clock. So we're gonna have to say goodbye. Thank you all for coming. And if you are around on the 27th, we might have another one. If you didn't get your answers, oh, your questions <laughs> afterwards, then yeah. We didn't get yeah. half the questions. There's still 35 in the Q&A, but we'll, uh, we'll try it. We'll try and uh, save them for next time. How long have we, um, how long have we got? Could we have another five minutes? Yeah. Um, Okay. I mean, All right. People I'll can quick, leave if they want to, but we'll. Yeah, I'll quickly go through ones. I'll, I'll quickly go. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll just absolutely run through the ones questions. Some of them. Bonus. Uh, Thirty-seven be, questions. No problem. Specific. Will there be uh, Joe Davison? Specific closed loop training modules for professional access. Yes, working on it. It will come through. Workforce also needs administration. Will that be funded? Yes. Uh, that's the plan. Uh, for my patient, do you pump upgrades next year? Should this patient? Do, we answer that. Uh, so that's fine. 
who take it forward for the ICBN Trust Procurement. Wait on that. That's what we are working on on a national basis to make life easier for you. Will children be part of the priority process across all trusts? Yes. Uh, will there be any choice in which CRM device? Yes, that will be all the choices that are available. That's what we're trying to do is get everything there. How do we ensure that ICBs interpret the guidelines equally? Uh, as I've said, uh, don't worry, that's exactly why I'm here, to help them interpret it properly. Uh, so I'll be there to look after that bit. Uh, online learning, as I said, it's coming. Officially, yes, DTN UK. Uh, how can I, very good question, type 1 diabetes, how can I and other patients contribute to rollout and education? I would, I'm would. i going to set up some different sessions. I'm going to want to explore what type 1 diabetes patients can do what is their education? It does happen in other countries. People with type 1 diabetes providing education support. We'll look at that. Um, again, that's more procurement question. The next one, application approval process. Don't worry, that's what we're trying to flatten out. There should not be an approval process for this. It should be quite straightforward. Um, will be part of the guidance include half on people on HCL to be reviewed as a minimum by DSN? I think that's a very open-ended question. If they're doing really well, very low. I very rarely see my patients on CGM nowadays. They do really well. It's great. So I think a little bit will depend on, we are looking at these things called patient-initiated follow-ups. So I think it works really well for these sort of systems. Super centers have answered. How will it be prioritized after children? Will it be fair across the country and not a postcode lottery? Exactly what we want to try and tackle. Will it be fair? Life is not fair. That's not going to be fair either, but we'll try our best to try and make sure that people have some degree of consistency across the board. Uh, patient choice, no process, very difficult chasing orders for patients. Yes, it will be in the procurement work that we do, so things are much more smoother. We appreciate a lot of the procurement work is learning about the, the missteps or the problems we have had around with pumps and working with companies to smoothen them out. Uh, would you support the creation of a separate team of technology pump specialists? We can't even get people just to staff our own teams, let alone a separate team. It wouldn't be lovely if we had that. Not gonna <laughs> is industry prepared we've got three of them here i'm pretty sure they're prepared i'm pretty sure they're prepared um recognizing people are living longer with several conditions what about frail elderly self-management any guidance or advice it's a fantastic question i think that's a specific group we're going to pick up a lot of training about uh, carers but we still haven't crossed the hurdle of training nursing homes and a lot of staff about using the libra let alone closed loops we need to worry on that one first where do we submit data? It's coming, it's coming. Don't worry, we're just doing a letter. Just trying to tone it down a little bit because I did the first draft, which is a little bit snappy. <laughs> just sorting that out. No, uh, exactly. I don't believe that. Wanting to get pregnant, go on to, only going to license to HCL for pregnancy has to be for legal reasons. That makes sense. We wouldn't want to go them into Iron Lance's product. Ipsamed, yes, that's simply because they're looking at stocks and supplies. But and to be fair, I think they are also waiting for the, the TA to come out, after which... Will it rolled out by region or ev nah, everywhere? Northern Ireland, uh, slightly outside NHS England. I can only speak for England. That's all I can speak for. Uh, why do clinics People have got to stop adding questions. We are yeah, finished. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to delete anything after eight o'clock. Uh, Sorry, guys. <laughs> what have we got? T try uh, system speed. No, that's fine. Uh, you're just deleting them, are you? Are the ones um, after eight o'clock? <laughs> yeah. Why do clinics not all use gold standard for CGM? Why do clinics not all do gold standard for type 1 diabetes care? Hey, forget about CGM. You just need to do gold standard type 1 diabetes care first, right? So I think I've answered them I all. I think you've done really well. That was brilliant. <laughs> well done. We should but have done I, that at the beginning. I think one, one thing I'd like to there. say to everybody uh, who are still here, please come and talk. I, you know me, I'm always happy to chat to people. Do you know, we're trying our best. We'll get it wrong. Uh, you know, in the middle of the world falling apart, this is really good news, right? We're all excited. We got here. Come and talk to me. If you've got a problem, if you worry, if you're angry, just talk to me. I can make you feel happy. I'm pretty sure I can give you something. I've already answered a few people who said, when do us well-controlled people get it? A couple of years. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. Don't worry. We'll do Brilliant. It. So just want to say a big thank you to all our panellists, all of our behind the scenes. So Lisa and Becky doing the techie side of stuff behind the scenes. Um, and thank you to you, Partha, for coming and talking to us. And we'll see you again on the 27th. Round two. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.